And joining us now is the White House National Security Council spokesman, John Kirby. Good to see you this morning, John. So let's start with this week's NATO summit. President Biden said Ukraine is not ready to join NATO. Steps have to be taken. What has to happen? Well, they still have to work on some reforms, political reforms in the country. And, of course, they're still at war right now. And the president wants to focus on making sure that they succeed in that endeavor. Uh, and as he has said many times, if they, get, if they were hypothetically to get NATO membership now, well, then NATO's at war with Russia. So I think we've got to focus on making sure they can succeed right now and give them the time and space to continue to work on the reforms that are necessary for any NATO ally to become a member. Reforms example of? Well, political, just political reforms, economic reforms, uh, governance, good, good governance, uh, those kinds of things. And President Zelensky told me that if the alliance is not unified in supporting Ukraine's eventual membership, it will only make Vladimir Putin stronger. I think what you're going to see in Vilnius is a couple of things. You're going to see the allies really stay unified on supporting Ukraine in this fight against Russia on their soil. You're going to see commitments uh, by all the allies to continue to support their efforts to succeed on the battlefield. You're also going to see from all the allies uh, a concerted, unified approach uh, to making it clear that NATO is eventually going to be in Ukraine's future um, and that in, in between the time of the war ending and that happening, that the allies will continue to help Ukraine defend itself. And, and, and I want to turn to the war. Some former senior U.S. officials affiliated with the Council on Foreign Relations apparently met with Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, in April. What was that about, and was National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan aware of those meetings? Uh, Mr. Sullivan was not involved. We weren't participating in that. Um, uh, they, these were private entities, private individuals meeting with Russian officials, certainly within their right to do that. Um, uh, and I, do, I don't know what, how much foreknowledge we had on this, uh, but it wasn't like the United States or the uh, government was involved in any way or but, participating. But, they, but he was aware of it. it. I think in general, we were aware that discussions were happening uh, at a private level, but we weren't passing messages through them. We weren't setting the stage for them. We weren't encouraging those uh, discussions or engendering them in any way. And those discussions were about negotiations with Russia. Shouldn't Ukraine have known about those meetings as well? The president's been clear that we will have no dis discussions with Russia uh, about negotiating an end to this war uh, w without Ukraine at the table. But shouldn't they have known about these private meetings if Jake Sullivan knew well, that, about that, private Well, you know, look, again, these were private discussions. Um, it, the United States government was not involved in any way. So I can't speak to the degree to which Ukrainian officials knew they were going on or not. They were private discussions not sanctioned by uh, the United States go government. Uh, but again, we've been clear, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. It is, is it helpful for private citizens like uh, uh, Richard Haas, a former president of the Council of Foreign Relations, to be having conversations with Sergei Lavrov? It is not unusual for uh, uh, people like Mr. Haas or officials at the Council of Foreign Relations or other private entities to have discussions with Russian uh, officials about any range of issues. I mean, especially you would think in the Council of Foreign Relations that that would not be something that would be atypical. The, the Ukrainian officials I've talked to since then are not happy about that, are not happy about those private citizens talking about negotiations well, again, when they I, don't want to negotiate right now. Look, you can, you can hardly blame them for uh, being concerned about any potential negotiations uh, or discussions with the Russians about ending the war that they're not included in, which is, again, why the president has been adamant there'll be nothing said about Ukraine about ending this war without Ukraine at the table. So I can understand the angst and concern about this. Uh, but again, I want to assure the United States government was not behind these talks. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about the cluster munitions. The president made the decision to send cluster munitions. They are banned in so many places around the world, inc yeah. including most of our allies. Why send them to Ukraine? Simple. This is about keeping Ukraine in the fight. You were just there. You talked to President Zelensky about the counteroffensive, and in some ways it's, it, it's not going as, um, as fast as he would like. Um, they are using artillery at a very accelerated rate, Martha, many thousands of rounds per day. This is literally a gunfight uh, in, in all along, from the Donbass all the way down towards Zaporizhia and Kherson. Uh, and so they're running out of inventory. Um, we are trying to ramp up our production of the kind of artillery shells that they're using most. But that production rate is still not where we want it to be. So we're going to send these additional artillery shells that have 
cluster bomblets in them uh, to help bridge the gap as we ramp up production of normal 155 artillery shells. So, it will so keep you're them sending in the fight. those cluster munitions because we don't have enough of the kind of munitions they need. That is right. I, I want to ask you why the U.S. has never banned them before. I mean, they're, they're obviously a, a threat to civilians if they don't explode. Why is the, is the U.S. not banning them, period? We are very mindful of the concerns uh, about civilian casualties and unexploded ordnance being picked up by civilians or children and being hurt. Of course we're mindful of that. Um, and we're going to focus with Ukraine on demining efforts. In fact, we're doing it right now, and we will uh, when war conditions uh, permit. But these munitions do provide a, a useful battlefield capability. And I will remind that while Russia is using them in Ukraine in an aggressive war on another country and indiscriminately killing civilians, the Ukrainians will be using these cluster munitions obviously, which have a very low dud rate, but they'll be using them to defend their own territory, hitting Russian positions. And I think we can all agree that more civilians have been and will continue to be killed by Russian forces, with whether it's cluster munitions, drones, missile attacks, or just frontal assaults, uh, than will likely be hurt by the use of these cluster munitions fired at Russian positions inside Ukrainian territory. And, and, and just quickly, John, one of the things President Zelensky wishes he had right now is those F-16s. Yeah. You said they probably won't be there till the end of the year. Is That's there right. any way to speed that up? He says foot dragging costs lives. Well, there's been no foot dragging on this. In fact, we're going to be working with uh, some allies and partners to get the F-16 pilots, uh, the pilot training uh, going very, very soon. Um, and we're going to work to get those jets uh, to Ukraine just as quickly as possible. I mean, obviously, we, we understand the need, but it will take many months. And again, you, you don't want planes on the ground on the tarmac with no trained pilots. You've got to get the pilots trained. These are modern sophisticated aircraft. It's going to take a little time to get these pilots ready to go. And there's also a maintenance trail you got to be able to put in place, logistics and sustainment. These are, these are, uh, these are high-tech uh, jets and systems, and we want to make sure the Ukrainians are ready for them when they arrive. Okay. Thanks so much for joining us this morning, John. I always appreciate it. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.